Okay, let's continue with factor coding. So, factor coding refers to how categorical variables are represented in statistical models, including, of course, linear mixed effect models. There are several types of factor coding which are available under Jamovi. So I go through them one by one and give you some information. The first one is simple coding, as you see right in this option on the drop-down menu. This is a simple form of dummy coding where all k variables are included without a reference level. This coding scheme uh, might be useful when there is no natural reference level. So you just include simple and that will be just good enough for your data analysis. In addition, there is deviation coding. There are other names for deviation coding, such as uh, sum coding or kind of effect coding. Uh, these are also interchangeably used. Uh, this method of coding compares each level against the overall mean for, uh, for example, for a factor with k levels, k minus one new variables are created, and then the coefficients uh, in this analysis represent the difference between the mean of the outcome for the corresponding level and the overall mean. So let me scroll down here and show you what I mean. This is the result of simple coding under fixed effects parameter estimates. Now I want to click on deviation methods and here we go. For example for groups, group 1 has been compared against groups Z, uh, one and two together. So there is some level of dependency here, meaning that in estimating the overall mean, we have also incorporated the mean of group two, as you can see, and have compared it against uh, the summation of its own self. Uh, um, I mean, which is the mean of group two uh, together with the mean of group one. Now, for time 1, uh, there's only a comparison between time 1 and 0, time 3 and 0, and then, and then time 6 and 0, uh, which is a bit counterintuitive compared with, uh, you know, if you compare it with the definition of, uh, that I provided, I'd expect to see uh, a comparison between each time and, uh, and the overall mean score, which is not happening here. So you can, uh, if deviation doesn't work for you, you can just click on dummy, and the dummy coding, let me just choose dummy coding for you, uh, is uh, a useful one. This is probably the most common method of uh, factor coding. For a factor with k levels, k minus one dummy variables are created. And, and then, um, one level is chosen as a reference level, which is often the first level. In this case, for example, for time, the reference level is zero, and then the rest of the levels are compared against it. So time one is compared against time zero, time three is compared against time zero, and in the same way time six is compared against time zero, and so on and so forth. And that's about dummy coding, which is probably uh, the most common, commonly used way of factor coding. The next one is difference. And I'd be honest with you, I'm not sure really what what is the difference between this difference and the rest of the, the options that I have provided before. So if you click on that, you will see more or less the same kind of output. So I'm going to skip this and focus on Helmert, which is actually quite different from the rest. So in this analysis, Helmert results in this sort of comparison. Uh, level zero in time one, that is time one, is compared with the mean score of the subsequent levels, which are time z one, three, and six, whatever the mean score of these three time references are. And then in the second analysis, which is labeled as time two, uh, time one actually has been compared with two subsequent time points, which is three and six. And the l in the last one, time three has been compared with a subsequent level, which is level six. And that's what uh, Helmert coding is. It's an interesting way of uh, doing factor coding. The other type of factor coding is repeated and then polynomial. Um, polynomial, I want to focus on polynomial because it's uh, kind of more interesting because it reminds me of ANOVA tables. Um, so 
in this case, we'll have linear, quadratic, and cubic way of comparing time points. And it's especially useful when we are comparing time points here. So it's uh, specifically useful for comparing ordered factors or ordered categories, which represent these kind of patterns. You know, so if time, if, if time one has a pattern of linear, then you will see that there is a significant p-value. But in the same way, uh, you see a, a quadratic uh, ordering also seems to fit well because you know the p-value is, is significant. But a cubic value does not seem to fit well. Oh, actually, it also has a p-value smaller than 0 0.5, 0 0.05. If you set the alpha level at 0 0.01, you will reject the fit of a cubic model or cubic uh, pattern to the data. So the competition will be between linear and quadratic functions. Um, I'm afraid this analysis does not give us more information here. So we should either assume that the change from time 0 to time 6 has a linear uh, progression or regression, or it has a quadratic regression or progression. Further analysis would be definitely required, for example, by comparing the fit of the f uh, linear and the quadratic functions, which I'm afraid is not available in Jamovi, but I think you should be able to find that in R. Again, I'm, I'm not really sure about repeat it um, and how it, it differs at all from the rest of the analysis, but um, I think you can guess that the time zero has been compared with time one and time one against three and time three against six. If you think it's useful for you, you can also include this. The other thing that I wanted to quickly mention here is covariate scaling. If you recall, we didn't have a covariate, so this section here is empty. I'm going to pretend that, uh, in this case, time is a covariate, and I'm going to move time to the covariate box. And please remember that this is wrong. If you are using uh, weak cell data, uh, ensure that you will not as, uh, associate time with the covariate because it's not really covariate. Co covariate must be a continuous variable, whereas time is not a continuous variable. It's just a categorical one here. But I want to just pretend that it's uh, a covariate, which is continuous. And as a result, I want to show you how I can ch uh, choose the very different options that are available under covariate scaling. Notice that time is now a present suddenly under the same box which was empty just earlier. There are several ways of doing covariate scaling, one of which is centered, the other one is z-scores, the other one is centered uh, cluster-wise and then z-score clu uh, cluster-wise and then log and then none. I'd like to take you through these quickly and tell you what they do. First of all, covariate scaling is also known as feature scaling or variable scaling. It's a step in uh, data pre-processing that's often used in statistical and machine learning. And of course, it includes linear mixed effect models. Uh, the goal of covariate scaling is to normalize or to standardize the range of predictor variables, in this case, time, um, or the features that you incorporate into the model. Uh, this is done to prevent variables with larger scales from dominating the model's estimation process. So what is the first type? It's centered. And I want to toggle back to my uh, file to show you how we can center the data. Centering is possible uh, by subtracting the mean of uh, the variable, which in this case is time. Remember, time is our variable here. From each observation, uh, so this has the effect of shifting the distribution of the variable so that its mean uh, will be set at zero somehow. I mean, after centering, the mean will be zero. But before centering, the mean of time is, I have already calculated that, is 2.5. Again, I'm pretending that time is a, a scale variable or a continuous variable, which, as all of us know, is actually not. It's just for the sake of presentation here. So let's center this variable. The first thing I need to do is to take the amount in this cell 
and then subtract it from the mean 2.5 which returns minus 2.5 so this is the centered value for the first person in this row the second value can be estimated in this way minus 1, one minus 2.5 which returns uh, minus 1.5 the third value is 3 minus 2.5 which makes 0 0.5 and last but not least is number 6 which is uh, 6 minus 2.5 which returns 3.5 and these are my centered values for the first person and in the same way you will estimate the center values for the rest of the people and they will appear below this block of uh, data. This is centering. Now can we standardize centering? Yes, we can. And actually the method is, let me refresh your memory, is called z-scores. So you can apply the z-score method. How does the z-score method work? In z-score scaling, which is also known as standardization, we subtract the mean from each observation, as I have already done, and then we divide it by the standard deviation of uh, that variable. So the standard deviation of time, assuming that it's a continuous variable, uh, I have already estimated that is SD equals three. Uh, sorry, 2.3. 2.3. So we divide each of them by 2.3 and we will get the z-score. So the z-score for the first one as an, exa as, as an example is uh, minus 1.08 and you can estimate the rest of it for the rest of the data. The good news is you don't have to do this manually. I just did it for illustration purposes. If you choose this Jamovi automatically will do it under the hood and uh, it will just use the uh, the factor or the variable to run the rest of the analysis for you. The third one is called centered cluster-wise. I guess you should be able to guess what the centered cluster-wise is. Centered cluster-wise is similar to centering, which I demonstrated a few seconds ago. Instead of subtracting the overall mean, which was 2.5, the overall mean of the variable uh, from each of the datum, data points there, we subtract the mean within each cluster. That's a grouping factor in our mixed model, which in this case is time. So we subtract the, the, um, the data, this for example zero, from the mean of this cluster itself. So whatever it is. And then for the second group of people, we subtract it from the mean of this cluster and then the third one f from the mean of this cluster. Now you might be asking what m difference does it make because if you calculate the mean of each, cluster, each uh, little cluster like this it will be equal to 2.5. It's true, I agree with you because it's a time variable, it's not a truly continuous variable. It, we need to have a truly continuous variable so these numbers will be different in you know, e each of these cells. When you compute the mean score you'll find out the, dif the difference is there and it exists. So it does make a big difference uh, if we use a truly continuous variable. And that's about uh, centered cl uh, cluster-wise. In addition, uh, z-score cluster-wise takes the same number that I just sh uh, demonstrated and uh, com uh, computes this standardized form by dividing the number over the standard deviation of the cluster. Not the entire variable, but the cluster. Finally, there is a log transformation and it's quite useful, especially if your data set has, uh, has a high skewness value or is highly or heavily skewed. In this case, we don't have any evidence that the data is heavily skewed, so we can just stick with centered if you like, etc. And that will be it. I just wanted to add one more point about this analysis. If you want to check assumptions, you could, you know, check all of these uh, boxes here. 
I don't see these two boxes to be very useful, but uh, they allow you to do a visual inspection of the residuals of the data. Let's recall from ANOVA tests that normality is tested by looking into uh, the skewness and kurtosis of the, of the residual. Although in some cases it's common to basically look into, I mean in some part of the literature, especially in applied linguistics, you see that uh, researchers have commonly uh, tested the uh, uh, normality of the data, not normality of the residual. I recommend that you look into the normality of residual instead of the, the raw data. This is one way of uh, inspecting the normality of the data. You can create a QQ plot by checking off these options here under the residual option. And in a QQ plot, you plot theoretical quantiles against standardized residuals. And uh, the trend line, which is like a regression line, represents a normal data. And the dots here, which are slightly deviating from it, represent your uh, residuals. The f farther this, this data from this line, the um, more deviation from the absolute normality your data has. And I can s see just by visual inspection that this data doesn't really have a big problem in terms of normality. The other interesting thing is, I'm going to go back to the centered here, uh, the options of covariate scaling. You can change uh, the different types of covariate scaling to see if there is, there's a huge impact on the normality of your data. For example, uh, z-score cluster-wise. I don't see a big difference here because, like I said, the data is not truly continuous one. In addition, you can also change the type of scaling for your dependent variable. For example, you can make it centered or you can make it uh, z-score. And you can see if the residual plot changes or not. The ultimate test for normality I highly recommend is to click on options and check off residuals. So once you do this, Jamovi automatically creates a new uh, block of data in your data set. So click on this arrow on top to see this residual uh, data here. Now, since you have the residual statistics, you can quickly go to exploration and under descriptives, you can uh, move uh, the residuals to variables and look at the skewness and kurtosis values for this one. Now, how do we uh, interpret the skewness and kurtosis for residuals? Technically, if the skewness, which is very small, which is almost close to zero, like minus 0 0.00378, if it falls between minus 1.96 to 1 1.96, that's minus and plus, then you have evidence for normality. And in this case, I don't think there is any devi significant deviation from normality. In the same way, skewness can be interpreted uh, as uh, if it falls between minus uh, 1.96 and plus 1.96, you have evidence of normality, which is the case here. So you don't have any cause for concern here because everything looks fine. And uh, that will be everything that I wanted to share with you. This was a gentle introduction to linear mixed effect models. And there will be more complex models, of course, under linear mixed effect models. Um, in a follow-up video, I will quickly show you how to incorporate a slope as well as an intercept into the model and estimate uh, the uh, parameters. And in the future videos, I will also use other statistical packages, such as SPSS and R, to show you how linear mixed effect models can be conducted. One last word before I close this video is, I highly recommend that you consider using linear mixed effect models in your uh, data analysis, because uh, as you saw, a huge bunch of variation or dispersion, as indicated by ICC in this scenario, is attributed to uh, people, for example. And uh, if you do not consider that, the precision of your data analysis can be uh, significantly affected. I hope you find this video useful. Please uh, follow up with my next video where uh, I will make the model a bit more complex. Thank you very much and see you there.